My name is James Takach. I'm a professor of English here. I know a lot of you know me, some of you probably don't. Um, Fifteen years ago or so, an RWC, Roger Williams College alum, named Robert Blaze, uh, gave us money for an endowed lecture series. And he said, I want the first lecture to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Moby Dick. Uh, and we said, fine, that's, a, that's certainly worth celebrating. And thereafter, we decided to pick an American literary work that's having a notable anniversary, 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, whatever. And if you can look at the little bookmark here, you can see the text that we've chosen since Moby Dick back in 2001, uh, and taking us up to 2016. Robert Blaze, uh, our alum, is in Florida, <laughs> but his daughter Jennifer is here. We're happy to have her. Thanks for coming, Jennifer. Uh, he, Robert usually comes to these lectures, except if he's frolicking in Florida. Or something. <laughs> and that's what he's doing. So we thank him for his uh, contribution, and uh, we're glad to have his daughter here with us. Um, by all means, take a look at the uh, In Cold Blood Truman Cabote exhibit in the library. If you kind of walk out, Christine Fagan, our library, uh, our uh, library collections uh, person, has put together the exhibit. It's in glass cases there. And there are newspaper articles, and books, and photos, and all kinds of things. So take a look at that on your, on your way out. Also, we have the film on campus, the In Cold Blood, the 1960s version, the black and white film, 1967, I believe. And that will be offered on um, okay, Wednesday the 30th, 30, 31st? Okay, Wednesday the 31st of March. So if you're interested in seeing Wednesday's the 30th of March. It's part of the RWU Great Film Series. So that will be on campus, and that would be an interesting complement to the book. The book will, uh, at first, this In Cold Blood first appeared as a series of articles in New Yorker magazine in uh, late 1965 and it came out in book form 50 years ago in January, 1966. Uh, and uh, was a, made a, a big splash, big, uh, became a bestseller, and has been uh, uh, filmed at least twice, and film made of Capote's life, title Capote, some of you might have seen. So it's a very interesting book, interesting read. Uh, Today's speaker is Dr. Thomas Fahey, and you can see his picture right in the uh, uh, program here. And he's the Associate Professor of English at Long Island University Post Campus. He's the author of this book, Understanding Truman Capote. Okay. And uh, he also, and has also written a book called The Philosophy of Horror. And his little biographical note also says that he has written several other books, including young adult horror novels. So I guess from Cold Blood, he got to horror novels somehow. I guess there's a connection there. So we're happy to have uh, him here today. And Dr. Fahey will uh, address us on what's so dangerous about In Cold Blood, Truman, Capote, American culture, and the literary canon. Thank you, Tom. I want to just thank Jim for coordinating this and inviting me to be here, and I want to thank the English department, Roger Williams, and of course the library for putting together this great exhibit. So it's an honor to be part of the lecture series, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I want to start out, I want to actually frame my talk with this question, what's so dangerous about this book? And in order to address that question, I'm actually going to start in an unusual place, and that's out in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles, it's a place called Glendale. Uh, and uh, in 2011, Glendale High School, 2011-2012, a high school teacher wanted to teach In Cold Blood for her uh, 11th grade uh, AP English class. So she followed procedure. You have to ask her department chair for approval, then the department chair has to approach the English Curriculum Committee for all of the Southern California public school system. They thought it was a fine choice as well. Her argument was, hey, I want to teach a book. Let's just look at law enforcement. Let's just look at the death penalty. Let's just examine violence in American culture. Sounds like a great thing, right? 
Then the English Committee for the Public School District then has to present it to one other board, the Secondary Board of Education in Southern California. And they got this request and they balked at it. A number of the members were very concerned about teaching this book. They felt, you know, it's such a grim story and it's so violent. Why would we want to put that in the classroom? Our kids today, they see so much violence in American culture. Why should the classroom be a place where that happens? They presented that argument to the Parent Teacher Association and they agreed with them. They said, yeah, we shouldn't teach that book at all. So think about that for a minute because what that means is that if this school board of education votes that this woman can't teach in cold blood, that's a decision for the entire Southern California School District. That's banning the book from high schools in Southern California in 2012. So they have a meeting in September. The board is split 50-50. They have to turn to the vice president of this board for the final vote. And she admits at the meeting she's never read the book. So she's going to need time to read it. And so she has to table the vote and come back a month or so later after she's read it and thought about it. So in that month, uh, faculty members, parents, teach, everybody start talking about this issue, whether or not it should be taught. And the news media got wind of it. So they start interviewing the teacher and the school board, and it becomes a very big local news story. Uh, television news, radio stations were asking people if they could tweet in whether or not they should talk, should teach it. And then, of course, a month or so is enough time for it to become a national news story. Should we ban this book in cold blood, right, in the, in, for the 2012-2013 school year in Southern California? So they reconvened the meeting in October, and the vice president uh, agreed that the teacher should be allowed to teach it. What I find interesting about that debate, in part, uh, apart from the issue of whether or not we should be banning books like this at all, uh, is the issue of what was it about this book? Because if, if we're honest, many of you read this book, uh, the violence in this book is far less gruesome and explicit than on most cop TV procedural shows, right? I mean, you've seen the first season of True Detective for crying out loud. I mean, wow. Uh, but even take a more tame cop show like Law and Order, which for a long time advertised itself as ripped from the headlines, where you could very clearly see it's essentially a true crime kind of show, at least certain weeks. And uh, Law and Order, uh, I would say, had a comparable degree of violence. And if you look at Law and Order spinoffs, like if you've ever seen that horrible show, SVU's, whatever that is, uh, that's a show about serial sexual predators going after women or children. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's much worse than this book, right? And anyway, so and think about video games, films. So what's the deal? Why is this the book that was the target for this particular kind of issue? What is it about this book? It must transcend the issue of explicit violence. So I want to come back to that question of what's so dangerous about it at the end. Uh, but uh, to try to kind of work our way there just as a quick review, uh, just as a kind of reminder, I'll show us a picture of the clutters here. Uh, as we know the story, November 15, 1959, Dick Hickok and Perry Smith, they drive about 400 miles to this sleepy town, Holcomb, Kansas, a little after midnight. They break into the Clutter family, the doors were unlocked. They were under the misimpression that Mr. Clutter had a safe with $10,000 in it. Mr. Clutter was awake and downstairs when they broke in. They said, where's the safe, where's the money? Because not only don't I have cash, I don't have a safe. And they bound him and they gagged him and eventually slit his throat, shot him in the head, and killed the rest of the family. Uh, now, uh, so this is an image of the Clutters from the mid-1950s. So uh, this is Kenyon, who on the night of the crime was 15 years old, so he's about five years younger here. His, dog, his sister Nancy, who was also killed that night, she was 16. Bonnie and her Clutter, uh, also victims that evening. The two older sisters, uh, uh, Beverly and Eviana, didn't live at home. So they're still alive. Uh, uh, and so here are uh, Dick and Perry. And this is one of my uh, favorite photos of these. These are photos that they uh, allow the police to take of them when they were captured. Uh, and you can see uh, reproductions of these in the exhibit uh, that we have on display in the, in the foyer there. Uh, what I like about this image in particular are the nature of like tattoos themselves. Right? Tattoos are often an expression of one chooses to get a tattoo to commemorate a, mo a moment, to invite one to ask about a story, to, 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 I don't know, lay some kind of claim to individuality, to seek kind of acknowledgement. You put a tattoo on your arm and somebody notices, a friend knows it. What's that tattoo? What's it about? They're inviting a story, right? Here are two men so oppressed by poverty and horrible circumstances. These are men desperate for acknowledgement. 
They wanted to be acknowledged. They wanted to be heard. They wanted a, their story to be told. They wanted a fair shake and always felt silenced and marginalized in American culture. And I feel these tattoos are kind of emblematic of this desire on their part to be acknowledged somehow, to want to have, tell a story, right, and have their story kind of heard. So uh, these are the men uh, that they caught within 1959. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. And uh, Capote read about this story the next day in the New York Times. Uh, this was the... Um, this was the story as it was covered in the Garden City Telegram. Capote quotes from this newspaper extensively in the book. Uh, as with the Hutchinson News, where we have uh, copies of articles out in one of the cases out there uh, that shows some of their coverage of the story from the beginning until the execution of Dick and Perry. Uh, but Capote saw a really tiny article about it in the New York Times. Uh, and he immediately was interested in investigating the story. He didn't actually care about whether or not they were going to catch these guys. It didn't seem likely that they would at the time. He was really interested in this idea, here we are in the middle of America, it's a small town, it's supposed to be safe, they're good Christians, this horrible, horrible thing has happened. How's the community going to respond to it? Like, well, how's that going to affect everyday life of people living in Holcomb? Like, he wanted to go out, talk to those people, and write an article for the New Yorker about it. Capote had done other journalistic stuff. He had written for the New Yorker and other places before. In fact, he had done a big piece for them when this opera company did this production of uh, Porgy and Bess that traveled to the Soviet Union, an all African American cast, and he went with them and wrote this long, long article about their, their experiences they had traveling throughout Russia to do this show, and he eventually published that as a book. So he had an editor at the New Yorker he was working with, he called them up, he said, sure, we'll pay for you to go out there, you can start interviewing people. And Capote was smart enough to bring his childhood friend and one of his really close friends, Nell Harper Lee of To Kill a Mockingbird, to go with him and do the interviews with him which was a critical decision because she was this really down-to-earth, easy-to-get-along person as opposed to this really flamboyant Truman Capote who alienated a lot of people by being way over the top. So she kind of helped get him access that he definitely wouldn't have had otherwise. And they conducted six weeks of detailed interviews where they interviewed people separately and then came together at night, compared their notes, and tried to get the most accurate version kind of possible. But as soon as he was down there, very shortly into this process, he realized this was not going to be a short article. It was going to be a much bigger project. Uh, it was going to be a much bigger examining, a, a much bigger, had much bigger potential to examine various aspects of American life and culture, not just the psychology of two killers, the death penalty, the legal system, the nature of violence, all of this stuff. And he realized it was going to be a much bigger project. Uh, so let's talk about, just for a second, uh, this is the copy of the cover of the first edition, and there's a copy out there again in the exhibit. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about, you know, uh, Jim just mentioned that it was a very popular book, but a lot of that initially had to do with how famous Truman Capote was. He was a superstar celebrity as far as, you know, I know we don't think about with authors very often, but he hobnobbed with the most famous, the richest people. Uh, he was at every major club in New York City. His, his picture was in the paper all the time. He was friends with Humphrey, Humphrey Bogart, Jackie Onassis. I mean, he was a superstar celebrity. A year before this event happened, he had published Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, and other things. So this is a guy who was a celebrity, and he knew how to market himself. I mean, P.T. Barnum would have been so happy with somebody like Truman Capote. He gave interviews. He was in, doing interviews about this book as he was working on it, doing public readings, talking about the nature of crime in America. I mean, he generated so much interest in this story before it came out. And uh, when the New Yorker published it at the end of 1965, they dedicated four whole issues to it. Uh, it was the highest sales that the New Yorker ever had in its history. Uh, and we have, again, copies of those four out there, in paperback out there. And then a few months later, it came out right, in book form. Uh, but we have to think a lot about Capote and how he managed the publicity of this book. And one way that he did it was through fairly uh, controversial claims that he made about it. And one of them was that he created a brand new literary genre all by himself. Uh, he called it the nonfiction novel. Uh, and let me show you his definition of what he meant and what he was going for with that. Uh, he described journalism as moving along a horizontal plane, telling a story while fiction moves vertically, taking you deeper and deeper into characters and events, and by treating a real event with fictional techniques, something that cannot be done by a journalist until he learns to write good fiction. <laughs> it's possible to make this kind of synthesis. So immediately, people were not so thrilled. Like, wait a minute, people have written true crime stories before. Theodore Dreiser did it in 1925. And what about all of your contemporaries, Capote? We have a bunch of authors writing at the same time. Norman Mailer, Tom Wool, Hunter Thompson, and we're labeled the new journalists. Is that really this different from that? 
But it's been a debated term, term ever since this book came out, thanks to Capote. Right? He kind of set the table of how people were going to talk about this book. One with that claim, and two with this one. This book is completely factually accurate. Uh, in fact, in fact the, sub, the subtitle of the book right, is uh, A True Account of a Multiple Murder and Its Consequences. Well, this claim was hotly contested as well. The people in Holcomb, Kansas, they read this book, and many of them were furious. They felt that he misrepresented the town. The Clutter family was very upset with him. Uh, and many of the detectives who worked on the case felt that Capote misrepresented issues. So this journalist, Phillips, Philip K. Tompkins, went to Kansas after the book came out in the same year and re-interviewed dozens of people and published an article in Esquire in 1966 called In Cold Fact where he challenges a bunch of claims, including a big moment in the novel where Perry, right before he's executed, apologizes for the crime. Everyone else in the crime scene said that, said the execution said that didn't happen, and pointed out that Capote was so sick to his stomach he actually left the room where it happened at the time. And of course, very famously, Capote, oh, and 15 years later, somebody compared, gotta feel sorry sometimes for literary scholars, somebody compared the New Yorker version with the book version, every word, every page count, 5,000 discrepancies from back all the way down to commas. Not how you necessarily want to spend your weekend, but still, somebody did it. Uh, but, uh, what, and I mentioned Harry's last words, but the other issue is the ending, and Capote acknowledged right away that he made up the ending of the book. He felt that the execution was just too dark of a way to end the story, and so he made up this ending where uh, they meet at a cemetery, the daughter, the friend of the daughter, uh, the clever daughter who was killed, and things are hopeful again. And it gives a, it gives a nice artistic frame to the book, because if we open with that Kansas landscape, it ends with the Kansas landscape, that kind of thing. Uh, so again, uh, just to put it in perspective, these are, these are things that people are still debating about this book. And these are based on Capote's claims, right, about it, at least in part. In 2012, one of the detectives who caught Dick and Perry, uh, Detective Nye, who worked with Detective Dewey, his personal notes and his crime scene file, which he shouldn't have had, actually, his family put it up for auction at Sotheby's. It had the original crime scene photos and everything, stuff that had never been disseminated to the public. It was on Sotheby's. The Clutter family was very upset. Uh, they filed an injunction against selling it because they didn't want those pictures and some other uh, materials disseminated. The judge agreed with them, and so there was this kind of back and forth negotiation about what they could sell and what they couldn't sell before it was allowed, those materials were allowed to be sold. But what was the media coverage like about that throughout the summer of 2012? About the factual accuracy of In Cold Blood. And how is this going to change it? Is this going to mean that we're going to discover where Capote changed the truth? Right? That, was, that was the kind of press line, that was the media line about it. So it's fascinating to me that that's what has kind of preoccupied him in the central interest about this book. It's, it's an aspect about the book that, um, oh yeah, that I'm not interested in at all. It's not what I want to focus on today. But um, I want to focus on the fact that I think this book is very much about the 1950s. Right? The crimes are committed, the criminals are chased and caught in 1959. The majority of the interviews were done in 1959. Uh, and this is a book about this is a book that's meditating on American culture, particularly a kind of culture of fear and anxiety that was pervasive throughout the decade. And I think Capote taps into it in really explicit ways, and it's one of the things that I think intensifies our kind of fears and anxieties as we're reading it, right, as we kind of get caught up in the story of these two criminals. And so I want to talk a little bit about those things. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, even Capote's reaction when he published the novel, hundreds of he received hundreds of letters immediately from people in the public responding to this book, and responding very much in a way that resonates with kind of what I just said. Uh, this is he gave this he said this in an interview uh, shortly after it was published. About seventy percent of the letters he got said the people felt that the book was a reflection on American life. This collision between the desperate ruthless, wandering, savage part of American life, and the other, which is insular and safe. It struck them because there's something so awfully inevitable about what's going to happen. Every illusion Perry would ever have, well, they all evaporated. So then on that night, he was so full of self-hatred and self-pity, I think he would have killed somebody. Well, perhaps not that night or the next or the next. You just can't go through life without ever getting what you want, ever. And although, Dick and Perry might be extreme examples of the consequences of this kind of deprivation. What I think is fascinating about this quote is the dichotomy that Capote sets up. 
there's this impoverished, struggling, stagnant group in America, right? They're disenfranchised, they don't have access to anything, and they don't have access to this American prosperity myth. Like, hey, look, you can get a job, you can buy a house, you can go up in the socioeconomic ladder. They have so little chance of getting that that they become ruthless and savage and kind of unmoored. And that's, Capote sets up that dichotomy in the book, and people were responding to that. And so I kind of want to talk about the way in which Capote taps in to the fears surrounding that kind of division in America. And I want to focus on three things. Uh, uh, the start of HUAC, the atomic bomb, and delinquency and poverty. I'll mostly focus on the third one, but I just want to briefly talk a little bit about how Capote incorporates and alludes to these things in the book, again, to tap into uh, this kind of culture of fear and anxiety that dominated the decade as a way to make the book comment on it and kind of reflect on it. So just a quick, few quick things about HUAC. It was formed in 1938. Uh, you know, and this is your kind of general definition, right? It's about sussing out the subversion among American citizens and organizations. What HUAC really did for the government is it, it gave them this powerful mechanism for enforcing political and social conformity, right? You're either a good American or you're a traitor, right? So if you've had any contact with communists or, or socialists, you are, you're not a loyal American, and there were, could be eventually severe consequences of that. And so HUAC, in the course of its existence, investigated about 1,400 groups and individuals uh, as potential subversives, including, of course, like newspapers, trade unions, things you would expect, right, the labor unions. Uh, as well as the Boy Scouts, and real troubling criminals like Shirley Temple and Lucille Ball, right? So we're talking about a, a big span, but probably the, the investigation that put them on the map and I think changed uh, or, or gave the American public a kind of sense for the scope of their power and the danger of it was the 1947 trials of Hollywood, where they dragged out Hollywood producers and filmmakers and asked them what became known as the $64 question, which was an allusion to a radio game show. Right, which is, are you now, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party of the United States? Right? And so all of these actors and movie producers and directors and writers were not only asked if they were members, but could they name names of other people in the industry that were, because you're making films, and your films reach millions of people. You could be sending secret communist messages to everybody. We can't have that happen. So uh, 10, famously 10 of these people investigated, who became known as the Hollywood 10, refused to answer those questions. That included Dalton Trumbo who wrote Spartacus, Ring Lardner, who wrote the film version of MASH. Uh, and they felt that their First Amendment right to free speech and free assembly meant that they didn't have to answer those questions. <coughs> they were wrong. They were held in contempt of Congress, and they all went to jail. Two of them went to jail for six months, and the rest for one year. Uh, but that, I think, changed the sense in America of what the kind of power that this group. And this was pre-McCarthy. This is three years before McCarthy is in Wheeling, West Virginia, saying there are 293 people, communists, working in the State Department. So before McCarthy get, gets on the bandwagon and creates fear-mongering and terror in this country, right, we have HUAC kind of doing the same thing. And, uh, and just, just to try to give you a sense of how bad that kind of culture of fear was, oh, I just want to point out there were just 109 investigations just in this kind of five-year period alone. But here's some stats about uh, how, just, this is early, 1954, right? 50% of Americans agreeing at this point that all communists should be jailed. 58% uh, favored finding and punishing all communists. But here's the stat that blows me away every time I see it. 78% of people, there's a national poll saying that they thought uh, that you should report neighbors or acquaintances to the FBI if you just suspected that they might be communists. That's an incredible amount of fear. Right, that you give, you should rat out your neighbor for whatever reason. Right. Uh, so this is part of this kind of culture of fear, and uh, Capote has characters that really kind of resonate with this type of rhetoric and ideology. My favorite minor character in this novel is Myrtle Clare. She's the postmistress, and after the crime, right, uh, everybody in town thinks somebody will. So somebody's killing and somebody, and everybody's freaking out. And so this is from the, the postmistress herself, and she said, uh, if, if it wasn't him who killed the clutters, maybe it was you, or somebody across the street. All the neighbors are rattlesnakes, var rattlesnakes, varmints, looking for a chance to slam the door in your face. It's the same the whole world over. Right? For her, anybody's a threat, anybody's dangerous. And that is very much that kind of Cold War kind of ideology of fear that was being kind of fueled by Huac, McCarthy, and others. And we get 
direct allusions to that in, in, the, in the text. Uh, the second kind of thing that Capote references are, it has to do with kind of atomic, uh, atomic weapons. You know, in 1949, the Soviets had their first successful test of an atomic bomb, and it scared the pants out of the U.S. because they thought they were years away from being able to do it. So this ratcheted up the uh, atomic energy program and weapons program in the United States. We wanted to be able to demonstrate that we had even bigger weapons, right? Uh, so let's scare the crap out of everybody. And that's pretty much what they did. Uh, um, and one of the ways, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that terrified so many people about it uh, was that a lot of this stuff was, in fact, televised and other things. But uh, let me show you what, what the government started doing was doing highly public tests of atomic weapons. Uh, again, to send an international statement, but also a domestic statement about our power. One of them was Operation Castle. Uh, this was a series of thermonuclear tests uh, between March and May of 1954 over the Marshall Islands, about halfway between Hawaii and Australia. Uh, this bomb uh, was a thousand times stronger than what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, that is inconceivable, right? Uh, this, make it, this Bravo test, it vaporized an entire island and sent a 7,000 square mile cloud of lethal fallout across the Pacific. That is scary business, right? Uh, and this is being widely reported. The government wants this information out there, and it is terrifying people. And if that's not bad enough, the government started televising testing of atomic weapons in Nevada. Uh, the most famous, oh, well, there's also the president's threatening that we would use atomic weapons. That always makes people feel comfy. Uh, and then we have the testing in Yucca Flats, right? where they were arguing that we need to do these tests here and send troops in and see if, what, what would it be like at ground zero if there were if a bomb went off in the United States, you know, would our troops be able to handle it? Um, and uh, on March 17th, uh, the Atomic Energy Agency staged a televised special at Yucca Flat. There was another one that had happened in 1952, so 53 wasn't the first one. Walter Conkright was in attendance. The media uh, were well stationed there, about two miles from ground zero. They set up a fake town with houses and cars, and if you've ever seen the remake of that movie, The Hills Have Eyes, it's all based on that doom town thing. Uh, uh, but here's a photo from uh, 1952, and you can see the public and the press and the military gathered here for this kind of this kind of test. Uh, by 1956, uh, two thirds of all Americans believed that the next war would use atomic weapons, and that an atomic bomb would be detonated in the United States. So, what's the impact of all this fear? Um, you've got bo uh, bomb drills at schools, teaching kids to cover their eyes and hide under their desks. Uh, you're training more and more medical people to have medical training, uh, uh, geared specifically for that. All of a sudden, building fallout shelters became very popular for homes, apartment buildings. Uh, you have all of these things that are just scaring the pants off the public. Right? We're terrified that an atomic uh, war is going to happen. The weapons of mass destruction are going to be used. Uh, now, um, oh yeah, and this is as early as 1950, which I think is incredible. 61% of Americans thought the U.S. should use an atom bomb if there's another world war. 53 said there was a good chance that their community, no matter how small, would be bombed in the next war. And most agree that Russia, Russia had the bomb, so it's going to get used. Right? And this is as early as 1950. That's before those televised things. I mean, it's it's an incredibly scary time. And uh, Capote taps into this as well, right? He presents this clutter of murder as a microcosm for these bigger fear, uh, fears. He, he presents it as this unforeseen kind of destructive, devastating event that happens. It, has, it destroys this town. All of a sudden, people are locking their doors. They're keeping their lights on all night long. They're moving away. It has these incredible kind of shock waves, and it causes this incredible trauma. This stuff. How could this terrible thing have happened? And throughout the book, he uses languages to allude to this kind of atomic age, right? There's this one woman who says that she used to enjoy at night listening to the prairie wolves like howling in the wind, and now it just reminds her of a bomb raid. And there's another detail where somebody called into the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and claimed that no one murdered the Clutters after all, that Mr. Clutter created a bomb of his own, a grenade with buckshot, and he killed himself and his family in this terrible explosion. And this one really gorgeous description of a man by a campfire trying to ponder how is it that a place that feels so peaceful and secure could suddenly just be annihilated, right? And this is his description, of, or Capote's description, right, of that. How is it possible that such effort 
such plain virtue referring to the clavers, right, could overnight be reduced to this, smoke thinning as it rose and was received by the big annihilating sky. So again, we see this kind of language kind of, of the atomic age being kind of utilized throughout the book is again some of the fears that are defining, right, American culture in the 1950s. Uh, now I want to turn to poverty and juvenile delinquencies. Uh, uh, and how this functions in, in the book. Uh, so even though the television was invented in the 1920s, it doesn't become the central the centerpiece of American life till the 1950s, so after World War, World War II. Uh, it becomes so popular so fast, it's kind of, it's kind of startling. So uh, um, by 1954, there are already TV dinners. By 1956, 81% of Americans are, have a television. Uh, Americans are spending more time in front of TV than they are at work. And by 1959, we've sold 50 million televisions. So, you know, if you see those pictures of the 50, the family gathered around the TV, like that's what you did at night and that's what you did at dinner time. So what were they watching on TV? You had live variety shows, a little bit like, you know, your late night with Jimmy Kimmel kind of thing, you know, just song and dance numbers, interviews with people like that. Television dramas were essentially filmed plays. Uh, um, usually stuff that had been successful on Broadway already, or original material. Uh, but the, probably the genre that was the most popular was the sitcom, uh, the 30-minute sitcom. And typically, if you think like Father Knows Best, or Leave it to Beaver, uh, these were set in the white suburbs, and there are white picket fences, and kids who are worried about allowance, and Dad has a Cadillac, and he goes to work, and Mom, miraculously, takes care of the kids, cleans up the house, and cooks dinner in high heels, and a dress, and makeup. It's incredible. <laughs> But that's the vision of America that is being kind of disseminated by television in the 1950s. Uh, news only constituted 15 minutes a day in the evening. That's how much TV news, which meant you weren't going to have a lot of deep analysis of what was happening in American culture. Now, why such a positive portrait of America? Well, we can kind of understand for some reasons. Uh, you've got, look at this, between 1940 and 1955, personal income jumped 293%. That makes people feel pretty good, right? Uh, America's consuming, we have enough <coughs> money, right, where we're consuming one third of the world's goods and services uh, by the mid 1950s. Home ownership doubles between the 1950s and 1950s. 18 million people moved to the suburbs in the 50s alone. Uh, so uh, it's kind of extraordinary. However, what's not on the news and what's not in your suburban community are poor people, right? But check this out. Between 40 and 50 million Americans are living in poverty in the 1950s. At any single year in the 1950s, 20 to 30 percent of the population was in poverty. I mean, that's extraordinary when you think about it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about where this, some of these ideas come from in just a second. But um, largely, the invisibility of poverty has been kind of associated with segregation, right, in schools and slums through mass production of affordable clothing, right? If you start mass producing clothing, it's hard to tell what class you're in, right? Same thing's true now. If we all buy clothes at the Gap, Banana Republic, and, and Old Navy, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, that you're a millionaire and I make $20,000 a year, right, if we're wearing the same kind of clothes. It's the same issue that's happening in the 50s. And likewise, there's really no political influence. There's really no one lobbying on behalf of the poor, right, in the 1950s. And to give you a sense for how serious it was, the very first executive order that JFK signed in the White House was to double the amount of food and food stamps to poor people in the country. That was the first thing he thought that was important to do. So it's a very serious matter in the 50s, though it's getting no visibility on television and in the main, in the main media. And uh, uh, this is, uh, just to show you, probably a book that was extremely influential in bringing this to people's attention, was Michael Harrington's uh, The Other America. Uh, he's writing about the end of the 50s, very beginning. This book is finished by 1961, he, so he's really talking about the late 50s. Uh, this is just one moment in the book. He says, the other America, the poor, feels differently than the rest of the nation. They tend to be hopeless and passive, yet prone to bursts of violence. They are lonely and isolated, often rigid and hostile. To be poor is not simply to be deprived of the material things of the world. It is to enter a fatal, feudal universe, an America within America. 
with a twisted sphere. Uh, what strikes me about this passage is, is the language is so similar to the Capote passage we looked at. There is a ruthless, savage part of America out there. They are prone to violence, they are hopeless, they are passive, and they are dangerous. Right? That something terrible can happen. And so what does Capote do in this book? Is that he focuses, he gives us so much attention on the poverty that Perry and Dick experience in their lives. Uh, to, to highlight this gap between the rich and the poor and the dangers associated with it. Uh, and so the first has to do with issues of, of criminality. Um, Dick Hickok's family was so poor that if his dad ever got sick, as, as is detailed in the book, uh, and couldn't go to work, then suddenly there was no food, or they couldn't pay their rent, things like that. So he li they lived at subsistence level. And so you know the fact that Dick eventually starts stealing cars or writing bad checks Right, is a reflection of this kind of constantly living in kind of poverty and seeking some way out of it. Uh, for Dick, though, had a better off than Perry, whose entire upbringing was defined by poverty, alcoholism, sexual abuse, uh, the worst possible circumstances uh, for Perry uh, and the Smith family and how he gave up. And so what Capote does is he basically presents these men as fully defined by their economic circumstances, right? They're poor and they're desperate. They, they are stealing cars and collecting Coke bottles and breaking into offices and breaking into clutter house because they don't have anything ever, right? They are so desperate because they're so poor and they see that there's this portion of America that can gain prosperity and they never can once get a steady job or get remote access to it. And so they become these people who turn to crime out of acts of desperation. Um, and at a certain point, what Perry recognizes is that this life has turned him into an animal. And probably one of the most disturbing kind of moments in the book is his description of him looking outside his temporary cell in Finney County, and he's watching these uh, cats scavenge dead birds off the grills of the cars that have just driven off the highway. And he realizes uh, that most of my life I've done what they're doing. I'm the equivalent. I'm just picking off dead meat and stuff from the grills of other people's car. Uh, that's the kind of state that he's in. Uh, so, but, so you have poverty as a thing that leads to criminality, which is dangerous for America. But you also have it uh, as something that kind of leads to violence. And you know, Dick is the one who, uh, whenever he sees somebody who has something, like there's this one moment in the, in the book where he sees this guy who's got nice clothes and he has a, he has a girlfriend that looks like Marilyn Monroe. And he, says, and he says, why should that goddamn bastard have everything and I have nothing, right? And so Dick's way of responding to it is he takes out a knife and he talks to Perry about that. I could slit his throat any, any second if I wanted to. And Dick fantasizes about doing violence to others as a way to compensate for feeling, you know, for being in this state of kind of abject poverty. Uh, so he's the one who tells Perry before they go to the clutters, we can meet, leave no witnesses. But that's how Dick talks throughout his whole life, just, to, just knowing that he could commit a violent act seems to mitigate to some extent, you know, the depths of his poverty, right? Um, for Perry, he experiences the same shame, oh, I'll show you the quote in a second, and same uh, anger, and he's experienced the same kind of uh, humiliation associated with poverty, and uh, he makes note in the story that uh, when he's in Nancy's room the night of the crime, She's got a purse, and he opens it up, and there's a silver dollar in it, and it falls on the floor, and it rolls under the bed, and he gets down on his hands and knees to crawl and get it, and he, he feels like an animal. And what Capote does that's so clever is he has Perry's analysis of that come right before he kills her clutter. So the moment before he slashes her clutter's throat, this is what Perry, Capote says that Perry says, right? But he, it's the way Capote times it that is so interesting. I thought of that goddamn dollar, silver dollar, the shame, disgust, but I didn't realize what I had done until I heard the sound, like somebody drowning, screaming underwater. So Capote links this humiliation associated with poverty to the very second before Perry makes a decision to kill Clutters. And I also think this is a powerful moment because it works so well metaphorically. Perry has been drowning and suffocating his entire life because of poverty. And so part of this kind of violence Capote is setting up as connected with poverty. Uh, and, you know, what's the, uh, oh yeah, and so that's one aspect, again, another aspect of fear that Capote is interested in. The last thing that he's tapping into, right, is this notion of juvenile delinquency. Hi, Marlon. Uh, uh, and I, 
basically, the issue of juvenile delinquents became this very prominently discussed topic in the news media and the public realm. In the 1950s, people were concerned that more and more young people were committing, not just stealing cars any longer, but committing violent crimes. Uh, uh, the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency was holding televised hearings about the matter where they were even dragging in the makers of comic books and saying, look how violent the cover of this comic book is. Aren't you responsible? Aren't you contributing to the problem in this country? Uh, and these are major televised hearings happening over the issue of, of juvenile delinquency. Hollywood taps into it. They start making films like Graham as the Wild One. Blackboard Jungle with Sidney Poitier and Rebel Without a Cause, James Dean, now knew it. Uh, these are major successful films, and they're tapping into these kind of anxieties about juvenile delinquency. Are young people running amok, right, and doing dangerous things? Uh, so much so, by 1959, uh, many Americans viewed delinquency more seriously than open-air testing of atomic weapons, uh, school segregation, or political corruption. So there was a point in time where the anxiety about people dressing like that, right, uh, riding their motorcycles and doing dangerous things became very serious. Um, I wanna, I'll talk about those statistics in a minute, but um, uh, sociologists were publishing uh, very heavily about this matter in very public and widespread forms. They were testifying in front of Congress, and they broke it down as there are two types of delinquents, right? There are your socioeconomic or the anomic delinquent, and that term comes from Emile Durkheim's 19th century notion of anomie, like kind of lawlessness or normlessness. And basically what that just means is you've got a group where there's such a big gap between the personal expectations that they have of what they can have in life versus whether or not they can ever achieve it, that that gap, since it never closes, that they turn to a kind of violence and delinquent culture. Right? Uh, Alfred uh, uh, Cullen, or Albert Cullen, one of the sociologists I mentioned up there, uh, he said that uh, basically uh, once these young people felt that legitimate channels to upward mobility were denied to them, that they felt justified turning to crime and violence as a result. So not just rejecting middle class values, it just became a fuel for justifying stealing cars and, doing, and committing violent acts. The other theory, it's really interesting, the psychological delinquent, which was kind of uh, spearheaded by Talcott Parsons, and basically these delinquents came from uh, you have an absent or an ineffectual father and an overbearing mother. Like that's what we should blame for this kind of delinquent culture. Uh, um, I don't, I don't know if any of you, or how many of you have seen Rebel Without a Cause, right? But Rebel Without a Cause is a, is a fabulous example of this because the young man in it is behaving a little bit like a delinquent, though he's bad. Uh, James Dean, he wants his dad to be a man, right? His dad is henpecked by mom, and mom has a headache, and so the dad puts on her apron, walks the food upstairs, and spills. He's on his hands and knees cleaning it up, and Jim's like, stand up for yourself, right? He wants a masculine role model. And what these, what this branch of sociologists were saying is the not having a masculine role model meant that these young boys were going out and to prove their masculinity through crime and violent action. And you see that, I think, that kind of delinquency is what Rebel Without a Cause focuses on. Uh, so what, what, um, what Capote does is he presents them as delinquents. Right, delinquents evolving into violent criminals. Right, so Perry comes from a broken family. He's abused as a child. He's first arrested at eight years old, and he's utterly seduced by delinquent culture. It just takes people mentioning something to him. When he's a young boy in San Francisco, one of his neighbors, Tommy Chan, gives him the idea, "Hey, let's go uh, steal a women's purses from them," and he starts doing that. He picks up a, uh, Perry picks up a hitchhiker once, who suggests, "Hey, maybe we should rob that office building over there." So they rob the office building. Right. Dick is the one who comes along and says, I have the perfect score at the clubhouse, $10,000. So, so Perry is seduced by delinquent culture. Uh, he's never had anything, right? And at least provides some, at least some means he hopes or thinks uh, to get something, right? But in this way, Dick and Perry are America's worst fears realized. They're juvenile delinquents that eventually resort to crime and eventually resort to, in the most extreme case, murder. So what is the danger of this juvenile delinquent culture? It's, it's crime, it's violence, right, in the United States. Uh, and uh, I think, again, one of the scary aspects of this book is that Capote wants to make sure that we don't just think it's Dick and Perry, that this is a much more pervasive problem in America. I, I, I want to 
I'll paraphrase this, but there's one sentence in this novel uh, where Capote lists other murder cases happening at the same time. And this is the description he gives. It includes an African-American soldier dismembering a prostitute, the bludgeoning of a young boy by an army corporal, the drowning of a nine-year-old girl by a hospital employee, and the strangulation of a 14-year-old by a laborer slash pedophile. He includes that list in parentheses. It's the scariest parentheses in American literature because the implication is it's, it's so commonplace that it just can be in parentheses, right? It's something you can ax out of the narrative, right? He doesn't give any more airtime to any of those things. They're just mentioned in passing. He then quotes from the Garden City Telegraph that points out that during the trial, uh, uh, or, or since the four members of the Clutter family were killed last fall, several other multiple murders have occurred in various parts of the country. Just during the few days leading up to the trial, these three mass murder cases broke into the headlines. As a result, this crime and the trial are just one of many such cases. Capote then gives us the backstory of uh, several mass teen murderers. One of them's on death row, uh, Lloyd Lee Andrews, who killed his entire family when he was 18. And then he does give us a detailed account of those two men, uh, George York and James Latham, who uh, killed seven people in a cross-country murder spree when they were 18 and 19 year olds, respectively. So what Capote's doing is he is giving us these other examples of delinquency, of teenagers committing the most atrocious crimes that you can imagine, and Dick and Perry have done the same thing. They're a little older, right, in the context of this book, but this is part of what's some of the terror and the fear that's kind of pervasive through America. You know, it's, it's fears about the atomic age, it's fears about delinquency, it's fears about what, what's, what are the results of all this poverty gonna be? What about this communist witch hunt? All of these things are part of what I think makes this book particularly terrifying. Uh, so that, um, that brings me back to our question which is what's so scary about this book. And we opened up talking about the fact that it's not that the crimes are rendered in such a violent way, right? I think it's this broader portrait of American culture as, and, and the terrors of sudden annihilation, right? The terrors of poverty, the terrors of criminality, the, the terrors of young violence. And I try to think about, well, what's happening in 2012 when the Glendale School District is looking at this book and rereading it and thinking whether or not it should be taught? Uh, I think these same, things that are scary about American culture in the 50 are scary for us now. We might not be worried about the Soviet Union dropping a bomb, but we're certainly worried about terrorist attacks. We are certainly, especially since the 2008 economic collapse, we are certainly worried about the growing disparity between the rich and the poor. And what, how long can that be sustained? How many riots and near riots do we need to have? Like, what's going to give? Right? I think parents are always mystified and terrified by teen subculture and the prospect of good kids going bad. Right? and worrying about what the implications of that are for the future. So, so I think that a number of these things that Capote is exploring, in addition to issues about the psychology of killers, in addition to the issues of, of um, uh, the, his indictment of the death penalty and things like that that are important parts of the book, I think this portrait of American culture is still chilling and unnerving for us because I think we can find that it still resonates with very powerful concerns we have about today, the things that need to be fixed in this country. So that's that. Thank you very much for your attention. I guess if there are questions, or we can ch chat about anything you want. Or... Some questions? First, about the book, or the meaning of life, whatever. I'm, <laughs> I'm here for you. Yeah? I'd be curious to know if anyone here read In Cold Blood in high school. I know of a cl I, I, I visit some high schools in Long Island, and I've seen the book in some classrooms, so I know it's taught a little bit, but yeah, I, I think it's still a rarity to, to have it appear in high school. Yeah. Yeah. So one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always wonder about that. We, we talked about this over lunch, perhaps, but I'll air it here. Maybe the clutters deserved some peace. They were murdered brutally extinguished from the earth. Did they have to be dragged up in magazine articles and a book and a film and another film? Couldn't they just rest in peace? Yeah, well, I mean, if they did, I, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, more seriously, uh, um, whether that's, I, I don't think that's, I think that's a legitimate question about what kind of respect and uh, that we should show people who experience tragedy. I think for Capote, when you look at, 
I think some of the thematic concerns and issues that he raises in the book, I think he is trying to craft that narrative as a cautionary tale about some of the problems in America more broadly and hoping that that changes the discussion about, you know, remember there are no Miranda rights when this book is published, right? And that, this book helps influence Miranda rights. You know, this, Capone went on the speaker circuit to uh, vocally condemn um, executing criminals. Uh, so I think he wanted this book to speak to broader issues and to help influence discussion and to make change. And I think he thought he could take that crime and do something meaningful with it. Uh, so I, that's, uh, and those are resonating with some of the things he said. That still doesn't address your concern as to whether or not this should have been used in that manner. You know, I, I don't, I certainly don't have an answer to that, but uh, it's, it's certainly worth thinking about. Uh, like I said, the Clowder family, when that detective's notes uh, were up for auction, you know, filed a lawsuit. They didn't want that material out there again. They had lived through this their entire lives, and they didn't want their family drag through it again, and images floating around on the net uh, so that anybody could see what happened to their, their family. So I think that, that's a powerful thing. Yeah. Can you tell us about how the book was received when it first came out, and did Americans understand at that time that it was about the American culture? Yeah, well, uh, um, it was a bestseller. Almost me, like I said, the New Yorker uh, had highest sales ever, and that's connected with Capote's celebrity as well as the book itself. It was optioned for a movie for half a million dollars almost immediately by Columbia Pictures, and then the movie was made. And so this generated a lot of attention. Um, but that, even that quote that I showed of the hundreds of letters Capote got, where people really felt that this is about America more broadly, I think a lot of people did recognize that some of the more unnerving aspects were. Uh, that this isn't an isolated incident, right? And so, you know, choosing this incident that happens in the middle of the country, in the Midwest, right? Uh, the heartland, like the, what's supposed to be emblematic of this peaceful small community that we all aspire to, right? This is where the danger happens. I think uh, that wasn't lost on a lot of people in terms of what was so unnerving about it. Yeah, and still is, I think. I mean, I think it's remarkable that this book is still scary to read. You know what's gonna happen before the first sentence and it's still <laughs> horrifying and compelling, yes. Uh, if it's true that we're in this sort of second uh, decade of fear-driven sort of culture, do you think we've learned anything since the 50s, or do you think there's anything to learn? Uh, do you have a theory on that, by any chance? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. A lot of the things you said that were going on, those statistics in the 50s, I don't know if it's that bad now, but I'm just I'm wondering if there's like a better way to deal with it, and maybe we haven't. Yeah, I mean, I... I I don't want to be a negative Nelly, uh, and be cynical, <laughs> but uh, you look at the persecution of Muslim Americans after 9-11, and you look at the protests we're having now about economic inequity and disparity, and it suggests to me that we haven't learned anything. I mean, I, that's not pleasant to say, but I have trouble seeing that we have, we have not really addressed the fundamental problems, right, that still create this economic inequity, and we are still just as susceptible to Fear-mongering, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think you can see a lot of that on display in the current presidential election, with a lot of things being said that are incendiary on purpose, and are divisive on purpose, and so that, and I know that there's natural cycles in history where those things happen on and off, and it's, it's about getting your name out there and attention, but that troubles me about how far we've come and whether or not we do sometimes lapse into old fears and, and concerns. Yeah. yeah. You alluded to Dreiser's American Tragedy very quickly. Yeah. A book about gruesome deaths in 1925 or I, I can't remember. Yeah. And then yeah. the Apples and Lobe Murders, which is the thing I was looking up when you were talking, 29, pretty gross and gruesome. Yeah. I'm trying to push your argument that it's really about the 50s. I guess my first question is like Glendale and other schools, were they uh, debating? whether or not to read those earlier books or showing suspicion in the movie because it also was so problematic that there are themes that resonated that, were, as you said, it's not just about crime, there's gotta be something else going on. Yeah. Was there something going on, not only in Glendale, but in other school districts where these debates were going on? 
for is about whether or not you should have any book with dealing with violent content. Right? Well, violent content, content where violent criminals are defined by their economic circumstances, which is a remarkably Marxist notion. Yeah. So you know, if that is the case, then maybe it's not unique to in cold blood. That there's a, it's got a nice long history and tradition of whether you want to use the term banning books or not yeah. assigning books. Right. Uh, we, let's read Fluffy Puppies because none of that resonates. You know, we, we don't have to even go. A and, classic. Right. <laughs> so I, I guess I really think about, like, has anybody investigated whether American tragedy was often banned or not assigned or debated? Right. And other books like it that precede the 50s. And then let's move forward to Executioner's Song, which maybe is never assigned because it's just so long. Right. But you want to talk about a book that has themes that we could talk about exist yeah. today. That yeah. felt Oh, okay. and, and I don't want to present uh, uh, In Cold Blood as unique to that. I just think that he anchors it very much about those things that are happening in the 50s. I think those concerns about economic inequity are pervasive in the 1920s. The, the jazz age, right? The, yeah. You're still talking about 20 plus percent of people in the 1920s living in poverty, right. but that's not what we see when Fitzgerald is in a, and his wife are in a fountain with champagne glasses. So, so now you're just saying yeah. that the book is part of a larger continuum that precedes it yes. and endures Definitely. today. It's yeah. just one of the one of the genres. And this is one that I think powerfully deals with it in the 50s, right? But but yeah, I think that uh, Dreiser's address, like uh, John Dos Passos is doing with his text in the 1920s, he is, he is really trying to get to that gritty underside of American culture that everyone seems to be ignoring. You know, so this is a quick follow-up. Is there something that you didn't talk about? I'm thinking Capote, sexuality, psychosexuality, the murders, and this, I mean, you didn't even go there, and I'm thinking. I had an, like, I had, I had an hour. I know you had an hour. And I have a whole book. Go <laughs> there. Read the whole book. Go, go there. We got a little more time. I think that's part of what people are not only scared, but not just the violence. This is kind of the psychosexual the, the, dark side. The, the, the homosexual undercurrent, oh. the, the affection between Over Perry using deer, deer and honey all the time, and Capote's own. Uh, uh, intimate, I don't mean physical, but intimate relationship with Perry during the process of the book and how that was part of, and Capote's flamboyant sexuality was part of his public image and part of anything that he writes is, is absolutely tapping into the same anxieties that the Beats are tapping into with, with how, with explicit censored scenes of sexuality at the same exact time period. I think Capote's part of that. I think the difference with Capote uh, is that he wanted to be a great American novelist that had the widest audience possible. He was afraid, right, to have explicit homosexuality, right, in his books. After his first novel, he doesn't really want to touch it. And I think that's because he really wanted mass popular kind of access. So he's not willing to do what Ginsburg does. And even what Gore Vidal, I think it was yeah. the book that his name escapes me, not Washington, D.C., but uh, the other one, uh, uh, the uh, Rosa. Uh, Anyway, yeah. another book that is frequently yeah. on that list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, we'll look up, but yeah. and I think it's incredibly important. And in fact, um, uh, I, in the book, I look at his novel, The Grass Harp, as a kind of reflection of the lavender scare and the persecution of homosexuals in the 1950s and how he's creating a kind of fable about that. And so I think there are ways in which Capote was trying to write about those things and get them in his text, but he also didn't want to alienate it might just give the Glendale School District one more reason to have this sure. pernicious conversation. Sure, sure. That they wouldn't talk about, that they didn't, those weren't the answers they gave in the interview. They don't have to. Right, right, right. No, I agree with that. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, and this goes into the broader issue of, you know, uh, Capone and queer theorists in general. Like, Capone distanced himself from that kind of movement and, and, and uh, did not use his celebrity to. Um, My regret. Oh, but yeah, uh, uh, he didn't use his celebrity to fight for gay rights at all, and so uh, that has positioned him oddly in terms of how critics see his work as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I see some students I, I went through the 1950s with last year, and uh, maybe uh, Dick and Harry have some literary cousins. Oh yeah, they're they're Dean and Sal. They're, they're, they're on the Sal. road. You know, there's no Holden Caulfield. Yeah, and maybe not. I mean, they haven't. You know, generated for that kind of violence. Oh, Dick and Perry they hop go. in that car and they drive across the country. They got their road maps out in right. front of them. They go down to Mexico. They come back. It's like 
awful in cold blood, right? I mean, it's, it's the same kind of uh, narrative, right? And it's, Holden it, is, a, is, a, is living in a land of plenty. He's got rich family and everything like that, but he's outside. He's distanced from it. Yeah. You know, he doesn't embrace that violence, but, you know, they're yeah. outsiders. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's in keeping with that, how that theme runs through 1950s kind of novels. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, but, but, but the language that they compare to use with one another, the, the affectionate terminology, and, and the fact that um, uh, there are readings of the book that argue that the reason that Perry kills Nancy is because Dick is, at, at the evening of the crime, is, is attracted to her and is considering raping her. And that if we try to understand the psychology of Perry, like that one of the motivations may have been because of his own kind of affection for Dick. And so that's been an argument that's been made by some kind of critics as well. It's an interesting one. Some other questions? Anything else? Or? I know it's St. Patrick's Day. I know there are pubs awaiting. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a tough sell. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it wasn't officially banned there. And uh, where? It wasn't officially banned in Glendale. They were debating it, and they eventually approved it. Uh, um, I don't know of any uh, instances where it was banned. I do not know of any. Um, yeah, and you have to think also that by the late 60s and the early 70s, this is when you have feminists reclaiming previously banned books, like Kate Chopin's The Awakening and things like that. So uh, the 60s is not the likely time for a book like that to be kind of banned, uh, but uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with any examples. I should investigate that further in case there's some school out there that didn't allow it to be taught, but I, I did not come across that when I was researching it. That's yeah, interesting. It would be interesting to see if it were what the arguments were for specifically, explicitly and implicitly. Right? So, okay, so well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for attending. Have a good afternoon. Happy St. Patrick's Day.